thanks everybody for uh, tuning in today. Hope you're all having a good Friday. Our uh, seminar speaker this week is Dr. Emily Cardarelli, who's currently a postdoc at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. She is a microbial ecologist, biogeochemist, and astrobiologist. Her uh, research focuses on understanding how microbes uh, interact with minerals um, uh, at across different scales, landscapes, and time. She applies an interdisciplinary approach uh, to her research, combining mainly laboratory and field-based studies, where she uses gen uh, genomic and uh, geochemical techniques to uh, characterize um, organo-mineral interfaces, so again, how microbes really interact uh, with minerals, and also biogeochemical uh, processes. While her work has mainly been in the American Southwest, uh, she's recently expanded uh, this work to Mars. Uh, she received her bachelor's in Earth and Environmental Science from Tulane University uh, in Louisiana, uh, which is in, in New Orleans, and then pursued a master's and PhD at, at Stanford University, where she graduated in 2020. And as I mentioned, she, she then uh, started her postdoc uh, position at JPL, where she's currently based. Um, there, she's been involved with the Perseverance rover, both in research and uh, doing operations. And I think she'll be sharing with us uh, some of this uh, new research a little bit at the end of her talk today. And so thank you again, uh, Dr. Carterelli, for taking the time to chat with us and uh, take it away. Thanks again. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Francis. I'm so glad to, to be here with you all, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some of my PhD research uh, that I'm working on publishing, as well as some new Mars-related uh, research and information on Sherlock, which is one of the instruments on the Perseverance rover, and that I'll introduce a bit later. So as Francis mentioned, I'm a postdoc at JPL, and I'm working on the Mars 2020 team, and there's uh, there's about 450 of us or so, and so it's been a very interesting uh, collaborative experience, and our main mission objectives are characterizing the geology, potential astrobiology, uh, sampling, and preparing for humans on, on Mars, and I predominantly focus on the astrobiology aspect of these mission objectives, but as Francis mentioned, I also work a fair bit in mission ops, so that involves uh, using my, ge my geology and Earth systems background to examine targets and select targets uh, in line with the, with the goals and objectives for, for that day. And a major question driving my research is, uh, do subsurface micro microbes exhibit patterns on regional, local, and or uh, spatiotemporal scales? And how do environmental factors and conditions influence the subsurface communities and biosignatures that we might see, both on Earth and potentially on Mars? And in mission operations, we have uh, SALs, which are uh, the days that we're on Mars. So for to Saul's adventure, uh, I'm going to start by talking about regional patterns that I identified in the western U.S., uh, and then I'll move to talking about a specific site. So I studied uh, five sites, which I'll introduce, and then I'll focus in on one site where we, we were able to do a temporal study looking at a flood event and uh, microbial community dynamics that, that occurred uh, with the flood to drought transitions, and then I'll move to uh, Jezero and talking about Sherlock and seeking evidence for, for past life using this instrument as well as uh, the other ARM instrument, Pixel. So we'll start on the Colorado River Basin, which I think is actually a fairly good uh, analog for Mars, so it's a semi-arid environment. Uh, it really only gets um, moisture uh, due to snow melt predominantly, and uh, the work that I'll present is focused on uh, the floodplains and adjacent areas uh, to the both the Colorado River, San Juan River, and, uh, and in the Wind River Basin, uh, the Wind River. And one of the reasons why I think that 
the West is a fairly good analog for uh, for Mars, particularly in um, in the wetter period uh, of its geologic history, is because that a lot of the floodplain sites or the floodplain sites that I'll present are former uranium contaminated sites, so they have been remediated, but they still have some uh, uranium within the subsurface. And if we think about uh, the subsurface in terms of uh, categories defined uh, by Jones et al. that may make up a habitable zone, we have uh, electron donors and electron acceptors. We have a potential uh, uranium source, as well as buried organic matter uh, within these flood floodplain systems, and these systems also experience uh, drought to flood events because most of their precipitation is uh, falls as snow melt and then releases through time, and so there's a characteristic uh, flood in the in the um, in the late May to June time period, depending on where you are. And so for the purposes of this talk, uh, I'm defining a microbe, a microorganism, I'm gonna probably use those terms interchangeably, as uh, bac bacteria uh, or archaea. And this is a fish image, and those are just a bunch of archaeal cells in red, and then you see the bacterial cells in green uh, within this biofilm, the single-celled organisms. And using, um, the 16S rRNA gene, so uh, I did do a fair bit of um, genomic sequencing as well in my PhD, but today I'm just gonna talk about um, 16S rRNA trends. Uh, and basically using this gene, we're able to compare different parts of the of the tree of life. So I'm predominantly gonna be, I'm gonna be focusing on the bacteria and archaea, but basically, uh, Using this this marker gene enables us to compare them at the same time, and also uh, led to the discovery of archaea when when uh, when Carl Woese realized that this gene it basically changed fast enough so you could you could look at changes between different domains, but it didn't change too uh, too quickly. So it's sort of the right uh, the the right amount of change. So you were able to compare within domains as well as across domains. And with, uh, with high throughput sequencing, we've been able to basically to indirectly identify many organisms that we previously weren't able to culture and uh, widely expanded the tree of life. So the so all these extended branches, uh, this paper was in uh, 2016, 2015, 2018. And even since then, it every year it, it, uh, it grows, especially with um, metagenomic and metatranscriptomic sequencing as well. And we study microbes because they're small, yet they're uh, they're mighty in their impact, and they can control major biogeochemical processes that affect uh, climate change, as well as um, different nutrients, like different nutrient, where different nutrients are stored that are critical to life, including the, the ones below, as well as, and with wide-ranging metabolisms, they're major players in cycling major nutrients as well as metals. So cycling nitrogen as well as carbon and uh, sulfur, which are mainly the ones that I'll talk about today. And those are outlined here. And compared to uh, the near surface environment, uh, microbes within the terrestrial subsurface are, are relatively unknown really below uh, about uh, a foot to, to three feet or so. And so I was interested in, in characterizing uh, what microbes were there as well as what their distribution was like if you if you looked at them uh, through a depth transect and looked at how they, they varied in the unsaturated zone down to uh, transition zone where you get uh, 
groundwater flowing and then the saturated zone, which uh, can, can vary depending on uh, what time of year it is. So throughout my PhD, I went to five sites. Here I'm just presenting uh, data from four sites across a 900 kilometer transect north to south. And these were all uh, floodplains on uh, floodplain environments on tributaries to the Colorado River. In all of them except for Riverton was located in the upper Colorado River Basin, which is where uh, it's actually, now that I live in Los Angeles, it's where we get our water from, from the Colorado River. And it all comes from the, the northern, or the upper Colorado River Basin. And for this, for this study, I looked at uh, multiple cores per site and looked at the, the microbes that were present as well as the diversity trends. And this was done as a part of the Stanford SLAC um, science focus area team that is funded by the Department of Energy. And so we worked together to, I was the microbial ecologist and I worked with uh, biogeochemists to put together the, the microbial uh, mineral story. And so this involved us uh, all going out and setting up a lab in the field and then coring um, using various techniques depending on how deep we were going. So in the top, we were digging down to about uh, 30 feet at rifle. And below you can see that uh, Scott on the left has a shovel and here we were only able to go down about uh, about six feet or so because we hit the, the water table and then couldn't go through through that. And as I mentioned, we examined these communities through depth as well as uh, across this large geographic area. And once we took the samples, then we characterized them uh, based on their elemental composition as well as using uh, 16S RNA high throughput sequencing and metagenomics. And these are some of the geochemical methods that I used to characterize the the uh, sediments that I was extracting um, the, the DNA from. So I was able to get, so using um, XRF, I was able to get a wide range of minerals and uh, as well as uh, doing water extracts and elemental analysis. And then I was able to look at the geochemical profiles uh, with the microbial data. And then we also used um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy to look at the speciation of both uh, uranium and sulfur in, a couple, in these sites. And once we took the soil sample on the microbial side, we isolated DNA and then, as I mentioned, we sequenced them and then looked at the phylogeny as well as the community composition. And throughout my talk, I'll I'll be talking about these four, these four uh, topics. So we'll be looking at the metabolic diversity that we observed, as well as core to regional scale uh, differences and, and how that varied with the water cycle and how the biochemistry also changed as we move through depth and time. So looking at the regional study and the, the five sites that uh, presented. When we looked at these uh, roughly at the same time, so uh, in August, so a dry period for this region, uh, we were able to look at, so this is the number of microbial taxa plotted against depth, and these are OTUs, and we looked at the abundances of the microbial community, or of the, we looked at the diversity of OTU, so the, the alpha diversity, with depth, and we wanted to look at what changes we could observe uh, relative to the water table. And we noticed uh, across all of these sites that we tended to see the greatest number of OTUs where we saw the water table, and so we'd see, which we thought was pretty pretty interesting, and then when we looked and we investigated that further. 
and we looked at uh, a number of depth profiles and I'm going to present them for one site uh, when we move to our next story. But we basically found that there were uh, major players that were responsible for specific processes, um, such as ammonia oxidation. So we found that ammonia oxidizing archaea were the most abundant um, ammonia oxidizers in the system. We found that nitrospira was the most abundant um, nitrite oxidizer. And they were vertically stratified. And we saw the thaumarchaeota and the nitrospira in the unsaturated zone. And then as we transitioned down in the cores, and this happened at uh, different depths depending on the site that we were at, but when we started to uh, go down into the water table and we're at this transition zone, that's when we started to see um, iron oxidizers and reducers, as well as uh, sulfate reducers and um, thanogens. And we also found uh, a unique methanogen that is capable of reducing methyl, compo uh, methyl compounds and oxidizing hydrogen to produce methane. And uh, methanomacillococcales was actually uh, first characterized in, in the human gut. And there, there have been maybe a handful of studies that have examined them in the environment, and most of them have been found in marine-like environments. So it was pretty exciting to see them at fairly high abundances. So uh, if you look at the bottom of the plot, we have relative abundance uh, plotted versus depth. And in some cases, this, this genera made up 6% uh, of the community, which is very high <laughs> considering they were characterized just in uh, 2014 or 2015 from the human gut. And as I mentioned, they've, they've only been characterized um, in a handful of environments. And we also observed uh, uh, methyl uh, mirabilase, which is a denitrifying methanotroph. So we saw that in the uh, transition zone of these cores, and then we saw them rapidly, uh, rapidly change to being dominated by the methanomacillococcales. And just to summarize what we found in this study, uh, we found that the subsurface supports uh, highly diverse communities in dry conditions and that uh, the water table influences the richness and diversity of, uh, of the communities present, as well as the functional taxa, including the methanogens. And we saw strong vertical redox stratification patterns, which uh, also present uh, in, the, in the next story. So when we noticed that there, that there was an, an influence of the water table within the, within the subsurface cores that we looked at, uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to build on our study and try to understand how dry to flood conditions might impact these subsurface communities, since we saw that there was this uh, regional regional uh, vertical stratification. And we sampled at uh, Riverton in Wyoming, which was the most northern uh, site that I presented previously. And this site, like the others, oops, uh, has this really cyclical uh, pattern. So this is the, the discharge, the river discharge on the left on the uh, y-axis and on the x-axis we have time. So you notice it is cyclical, but the, uh, the magnitude can change as well as the, um, the magnitude timing and uh, snow delivery flash. So how much snow is delivered as well as how quickly the snow melts in any given year can impact these annual and long-term trends. <clears throat> And if you notice where the arrows are, uh, so as I mentioned, we have the high flow conditions in June, and then we see low flow conditions in August. Uh, and the arrow indicates, uh, can see that that point is actually quite high. Um, and 
that happened to be in 2016, when, uh, right after we had done our, our study of the communities under dry conditions, we had a massive flood and that was due to the uh, El, El Nino conditions between 2015 and 2016. And when you have a flood event, the snow melt, not only does it uh, alter the, the river conditions, it, under low flow conditions, you have the, the stream banks exposed and then under high flow conditions you'll have the, the the river stream overflow its bank and deposit deposit sediments there and depending on how quickly uh, the snow melts so the magnitude of the flood as well as the timing so if it's melting slowly or if it melts quickly because there's one hot day that can all influence the flow regime for the floodplain, which will, which will impact whether sediment is deposited or eroded from these from these banks. And when you do have deposition, these can record uh, past conditions in in within the river. And uh, we found that these these uh, zones, which were high in uh, that could potentially become uh, exposed, that they held uh, lots of carbon and uh, metals, and so we, we called them naturally reduced zones. So they tended to be reduced, so they were fine grain sediments that were deposited amongst these uh, larger grain sediments. You can see there's some large cobbles there, so indicating that there you know, was higher uh, Higher, a higher flood regime versus when uh, you had these fine grain sediments in which you had a lower flow regime and these were deposited. And so because they were reducing, they tended to contain um, carbon as well as nitrogen and other, uh, other metals because they were reduced. And as I mentioned before, when you have these flood events and depending on how quickly they happen, and what magnitude they are, they can they can alter the the biogeochemistry of the floodplain. And uh, these naturally reduced zones can uh, can support large diverse microbial communities depending on what is contained uh, within these zones. And as I mentioned, uh, flooding impacts the alluvial biogeochemistry, and this is this has been well known and was one of the rationales for us first working at these sites because uh, post floods, uh, we would notice that uranium would actually become mobilized, uh, which was contrary to a lot of the initial evidence when they had first built these um, these processing sites and in which they, they thought that uranium would dilute when you had a flood event, but because the, the snow melt water is oxidizing, it actually would, uh, uranium's not mobile when it's in its reduced form in uranium as uranium-4, but if it became oxidized to uranium-6, then it would become mobilized and potentially with the, the bicarbonate in the water. And so we know that it influences the the oxidation state of the of the floodplain, but we were we did not know how it affected uh, other species within the floodplain as well as the microbial ecology and uh, how the communities might change. Oh, and lucky for us, we had the the El Nino event that occurred between 2015 and 2016 that produced a record flood for us to to examine. And as I mentioned, we, we knew that uh, from our previous study that uh, hydrologic zonation influenced the diversity and distribution of specific functional taxa, but we wanted to know what happened to the vertical stratification patterns that we saw over these events and uh, what would happen to the microbial diversity um, within these, these cores. And so these are the three times that we sampled. So when we took our first uh, sample, it was under low flow conditions. And then 
after the, the peak of the flood, uh, when we were able to access the floodplain, we sampled uh, under the high flow conditions, and then we sampled again in uh, August, which was again a low flow condition. And here's just the magnitude of that flood compared to uh, the hydrologic history of the of the area, and so it was the the third largest flood on record since uh, the 1940s. And we looked at two cores, uh, different distances from the river that are presented here. And again, we sampled um, regularly with depth and characterized the communities as well as the, uh, the sediments that were there. And similar to the, the plot that I showed earlier on the regional scale, when we looked on a um, temporal scale, we saw that the diversity was higher um, in the, under the dry conditions in 2015. And then when we had the flood event, we see that it does decrease the, the number of taxa that are present, but the shape of the, of the trend is relatively the same as the, the dry conditions. And then uh, in 2016, we see that uh, where we previously had the highest microbial communities, that, that is where we see them um, dip back down. And we see that they're much lower than uh, the initial time point or the secondary time point. And as I mentioned, so in, uh, so in one of the cores in KB1, which is closer to the river, we see uh, significant differences between the number of taxa between the uh, the first time point and the second time point and as well as the first time point and the third time point however when we look at the other core which is farther from the river we see that the differences in in taxa are not significant and when we look at uh, the functional taxa uh, for example those related to ammoniox, ammonia oxidation, we see that, uh, so this is the initial sampling condition, and we see that in the top um, 100 centimeters, we see that uh, nitrous asphera, which is typically a terrestrial-like um, ammonia oxidizing archaea, is uh, very abundant, and then decreases in abundance uh, in this transition zone, uh, which is where we, we have uh, the transition zone that was previously shown between the unsaturated and saturated zone and then we see below the transition zone that the that the ammonia oxidizing or uh, ammonia oxidizing tax that's most abundant is the nitroso archaeum which is typically found in estuaries uh, below that which might be expected uh, given that this is a, a saturated a saturated zone but still uh, maybe surprising for terrestrial environments. And then below um, 200 centimeters, we don't see any ammonia oxidizing archaea. And when we look at the flood conditions, as I mentioned, uh, this a snowmelt driven flood here is actually an oxidizing event for the, for the subsurface. So we see that there are nitrosospera like um, ammonia oxidizing archaea that are present in the top 100 centimeters as we saw before, but actually we see we see them deeper down uh, to about 150, even down to um, a little bit past 200 uh, under the, the flood conditions. And then we see that the nitrous archaeum are uh, less abundant, but still still present um, below, below 150 centimeters, but also present deeper down than previously observed. And under dry conditions, we see that uh, after the flood in, in 2016, we see that the, uh, the stratification seems to resume, and we see the terrestrial-like ammonia oxidizing archaea in the top 100 centimeters. And then we, we don't see the nitrous archaeum come back in the same abundance as that we previously observed, uh, but we do see that uh, the ammonia oxidizing archaea are not really present after or below 200 centimeters, and, and they require oxygen. So that might suggest that 
that it's returned to a, a more um, reduced environment. So when we look at taxa related to uh, sulfur cycling, we see really prominent depth trends as well. And uh, in between 100 and 200, between 100 and 200 centimeters, we see uh, sulfur fustus, which oxidizes um, the sulfur species presented on the right, and uh, disulfur ammonis, which oxidize or which reduces elemental sulfur present. And then below 200 centimeters, we see um, thermo fibrio, and then we see um, disulfobacca, and they may reduce um, similar sulfur compounds, but uh, disulfobacca requires acetate, and uh, thermo uh, fibrio requires uh, hydrogen, so they're able to coexist. And we also looked at the uh, speciation uh, of the of the iron and sulfur and saw that uh, we had calcium sulfate and then in the deeper depths below uh, 200 centimeters we saw more reduced sulfur uh, phases which is consistent with our hypothesis that the environment's reducing below 200 centimeters. Now under the flood conditions we we see disulfobacca and thermodisulfobacca sulfa vibrio, uh, we don't see them in the profile, and we see reduced numbers of uh, sulfur fustus as well as um, disulfur ammonis, or increase about the same for disulfur ammonis, but present throughout a greater extent of the column. And then under dry conditions, we see that uh, the stratification seems to, seems to return, and we start seeing um, taxa that require anaerobic conditions present again. And when we look at um, anaerobic carbon cycling uh, taxa, so we looked at, uh, we predominantly saw Bathyarchaeota methanomycillococcales, as I previously mentioned, and we did see a small number of methano uh, sarsinales. And under the dry conditions, we, we see them in particular in 2015. Uh, and then during the flood conditions, we don't see them at all, which was quite striking since they're uh, present in up to 15% of the, of the community. And then after the, the flood, we see them come back to uh, less than 5%. But it does seem to uh, indicate that, that the conditions are reducing and favorable for them to come back. So large takeaways from the spatiotemporal study. Um, large flood events alter the stratification and structure of subsurface communities, and there's an overall decrease in size of the uh, community, and as well as in the evenness, which uh, I'm not showing here today, but uh, you tend to get a few, num a few microbes that tend to um, incre increase quite drastically, so the, the community is less even. Uh, after the flood, and we see that the the taxa that do become uh, more abundant are different than the taxa that uh, that we started with, so indicating that microbial succession might be occurring. And the flood also breaks down uh, the geochemical trends that we observed previously, structured by the wa by water and the water table, and it seems like there's a community recovery period. And so just some broad takeaways from, uh, from the work I presented today. Uh, and if you have questions about anything, uh, feel free to, to ask. I'm happy to go into more detail. I just wanted to make sure we got to Mars <laughs> after talking about the regional distribution of these, these microorganisms. Uh, so we see diverse microbial communities present uh, and some really interesting taxa, uh, both from the ammonia oxidizing perspective or as well as from the uh, methanogens. We see regional depth-specific stratification occur uh, and develop, and we also see that water structures uh, the subsurface microbial communities and uh, potential redox gradients that set up. And when we have uh, fly or flood to dry conditions, we see that those might support um, microbial succession.
And coming back to uh, how it might be relevant to habitability on Mars, uh, I didn't mention this, but the, the archaea that I mainly talked about, the methanomacillococcales, as well as the ammonia oxidizing archaea, they make unique lipids. And uh, knowing that they're most abundant in the subsurface might help us target uh, target potential biosignatures that we're looking at on Mars, and we also and also uh, I think that this this region could be an uh, an analog for the period that we think uh, Mars under which Mars was uh, cold and wet, so basically in the Noachian, and might be a, a, a good place to look for. Um, how biosignatures are being preserved, since it's also a an arid environment that might have experienced that experiences uh, major major flood and drought conditions. So moving to Mars, uh, this is Jezero Crater, and the star indicates where we landed on February 18th uh, of this year, and we believe that this is an ancient river delta, um, and was previously an ancient lake that also underwent uh, a large dewatering event. And here's Perseverance, and I wanted to provide the link for, uh, for images that were publicly available. So the images come down every day, and or almost every day, and they're released to the public about the same time uh, that we get them. So if you're curious, uh, please go here and, and follow along. Um, and there's also a geocache um, target on Percy, so you can also, you know, figure out where Percy is through that through that way too. Uh, and the instrument team that I belong to uh, is the Sherlock team, and Sherlock is, if we go back to Percy, uh, to the right is the arm that's raised up, and this is one of the main features that's uh, really cool about the Perseverance rover versus the Curiosity rover is that we have this extendable arm that's uh, cap capable of taking selfies, but also capable of drilling cores. So we have uh, 43 core tubes on board, and we'll be taking about uh, 38 of them. And within, within that arm, in addition to the drill, there's also uh, two instruments. So Pixel is basically an XRF. Uh, on the arm that is portable, and then we have Sherlock, which is which stands for scanning habitable environments with Raman and luminescence for organics and chemicals. So basically, we use a deep UV Raman to uh, to look at patches of, of rock or regolith to potent, to detect uh, organic compounds and chemicals. And these, so this is where we have been so far, and. Uh, Sherlock also has Watson in it, which is a, uh, a really great camera and allows us to not only look at the, um, the minerals that are present, but also look at, uh, look at the topographic features that they might be associated with so we can map it back to it. And the image in the middle was taken by Watson, and the detail is just amazing. I don't have a scale bar on there, but... Uh, the, Im the image is similar, or it's the same. I have oriented them, so the shots where you see here, uh, you can see on the other image, and there is a scale bar. So these, this is less than uh, on the millimeter scale, and we're able to make out uh, grains as well as grain shapes, and uh, it's, it's pretty phenomenal and really nice to have when you're mapping back the uh, spectra you're getting. and to see if it correlates to a potential grain or a grain boundary. Been very useful so far, and as I mentioned, we're making these maps, and uh, we have successfully deployed uh, both instruments on the same target, I think, three times now. <laughs> uh, two times on an abraded patch, so basically when we lower the arm, we, when we're looking at a rock, we abrade away the surface of the rock because we don't have a rock hammer so we can't break open the rock to look at it but we abrade it away and then we image it using pixel and sherlock and then we're able to make these maps so 
we might be able to detect um, signs of life within within rocks that are about the same age. So we think that the rocks in Jezero, especially the ones we're looking at right now, are um, two to four billion years old, and this this uh, stromatolite provides a, a nice example to show how they how they work together. And this is an SEM image of uh, one of my other projects that I'm working on now is looking for organic matter in uh, magnesium carbonates since uh, we've detected them from orbit on on Mars using Chrism. And this is a this is a magnesite from uh, Australia, and uh, the dark gray blob is uh, organic matter uh, in association with a with a chromite. So. If we find it, you know, we'd love to find something like this, but this is uh, quite small for, for the scale that Watson can detect. But um, uh, that is what we're, we're hoping to look for in addition to um, spectra that are associated with organic compounds. And just to wrap up, so today we looked at uh, vertical microbial community assembly patterns within the alluvial subsurface in the West. And we also looked at how a flood could uh, flood disturbance could destabilize the microbial and geochemical gradients that set up and initiate microbial succession. Uh, and we also looked at uh, Sherlock and uh, discussed how we might find signs of life using it. And with that, I will take any questions.